Please welcome a man who has possibly the most scrutinised, high profile, talked about job in the country after the Prime Minister. And actually, I think that's debatable. But what did the harsh dressing rooms of the programme teach him about resilience? What advice would he give for ignoring the noise? And as a man whose every decision is forensically dissected, how does he manage to have a big impact on people with limited time? And what's the trick to staying true to yourself in the strongest public glare? It's a pleasure to welcome a man who had a successful playing career for club and country, who first became a manager in his mid-30s and just 12 odd years later was managing his country in a World Cup semi-final. Welcome to High Performance, the England men's football manager, Gareth Southgate. Good morning to you both. Nice to have you with us. I'm a bit more nervous after that introduction than I ah, first started. You've got no need for any nerves. <laughs> um, look, I know you listen to the pod, so you know how the pod starts. What is High Performance? Yeah, I've, I've heard you ask this question to so many people and I used to walk around thinking, how would I answer that? Uh, and I think in my head it comes to that never-ending quest for perfection that we know we'll probably never get to. I think there's something that I've seen in winning cultures about doing the basics brilliantly, but then diving into all the other detail that can add the, the the small margins that help you to win and the last bit would be about consistency doing it every day and year after year so winning after winning if you're fortunate enough to get to the point of winning in the first place so I, I would feel they would be the key elements in my head so how then if that's your definition of high performance do you get to the absolute granular detail of things because it sounds like you hone in on every little element to make it as good as it can be. I mean, perfection was the word you used. How do you do that without becoming myopic, with retaining the bigger picture, which you absolutely need when you're managing a group of footballers? I think that's where the importance of team comes in. So um, I'm the one that get, is the front man for the national team, as you said, a lot of scrutiny, but without having brilliant people with you, um, how can you possibly be across all the detail, all the different departments, everything that you need in place to be successful? So I know you spoke with Toto Wolf. I had a couple of days with them at Mercedes. What fascinated me was that their attention to detail in every area was the best I've seen. I felt it was the best environment I'd been to. And I've got to have an understanding of everybody's role, of everybody's world, a pretty good level of um, what excellence looked like in each area, but I can't possibly know what all of my staff in the analysis department, physical performance department, the people, uh, people comms department, they're the experts. I've got to help them, give them the space to be able to do their job to the best possible level. And if everybody does that, then the accumulation of all those things will give us the best chance of winning. So it's about culture then, to make sure that the people who you can't be managing on a day-to-day -day basis still are on the same wavelength as you? Yes, because in our organisation, it's slightly different to a club where people have a day-to-day -day role with the FA. So they've got maybe work with the junior national teams, maybe in other departments with the FA. So our communications department have obviously got ongoing dramas <laughs> of varying levels. Um, but then bringing all of that group together to work on senior team planning, um, tournament planning, camps, um, so that when the players come in, which obviously isn't on a day-to-day -day basis, so again, different to club, the environment that the staff are creating is the best possible environment for the players to succeed. So it sounds like you've got almost two teams there that you have to manage then, Gareth. So you've got the, the on-field team of players that turn up and but the guys that are off it as well. And how consistent is your approach with both of those two groups? Um, well, I would hope very consistent in that I like the idea of empowering people, but I recognise people have to be led and people have to be guided and they look to the leader for answers, for approval, for, um, you know, particularly in the moments of pressure, where are we heading? Um but everybody is responsible for creating the environment. So we talk a lot about culture in every business, in every sport. 
I think decisions that we make um, set a lot of that culture. But then having the having the right people in the building, you know, it's culture is created by people. It's not everybody will have things on the wall, won't they? It's what you do every day. It's I can talk to the players about how I want things to be. If I then stand on the sideline and my behaviours on the touchline are completely different to that, they give the ball away and I'm, you know, crouching down like Basil Forty, <laughs> then that's, they're not going to think that it's okay to make a mistake or to to play without fear. So, you know, people say f sometimes footballers aren't intelligent, but they're the savviest people that I know. Yeah. And they would pick up on anything like that really quickly. So how would you like your players and your staff to describe the culture you've created in England? Firstly, I want them to enjoy it. Slightly old fashioned view of sport. Yeah, but important though. I think when St George's Park was built, Dan Ashworth came in as technical director who's now at Brighton. And we talked a lot about the shirt feeling heavy, the pressure, the, you know, all the things that you can be, you can allow to be the narrative around the team. But fundamentally, how do we get people to want to come at every age group, be with England, enjoy the experience, want to come back? You know, one of our big challenges now is we've got lots of boys that could play for two or three different countries. So it's not just... Uh, we're England, so we should, be, you know, we should kind of have the arrogance that everybody will just want to play. Boys have got options, decisions, family ties with other countries that are quite strong as well. So we've got to have an environment people want to come. I think if they feel there's a chance of winning, that that can help as well. But I think it, I think wanting to be there, wanting to be part of something that they feel is a high level is enjoyable, that culturally is right. I think that is very important to people. Which leads us then to, if we go to the start of your career, when we talk about culture, Gareth, there's, a, there's something that's often intrigued me about your story, that you've a self-described shy kid from Crawley that went into what, from the outside, looked quite a brutal dressing room at Crystal Palace of lots of street smart South London kids. And what often intrigues me is from the moment you're going in there to leading them as a captain a number of years later, while still seeming to retain your authenticity and your integrity. Would you tell us a bit about that journey? Yeah, I suppose. Um, I mean, I grew up in Crawley. We'd moved around the country with my family, but I grew up school-wise mainly in Crawley. So a new town, slightly out out the way but I mean people wouldn't say you know you're in the country but to the lads in South London that was in the country <laughs> so um, went to a comprehensive school 1500 kids but my parents were always you've got to get your education right so worked hard but sport was always the thing that really lit me up so I got good O levels which at that time within a group of apprentices we had a couple of lads who went and took a levels actually but in general it was oh, okay so you're the SWAT yeah. and how you're going to fit in and I remember um Mark and Ian Wrighty and Brighty sort of giving me some stick one day about and uh, about that side of things and Steve Koppel sort of trying to put them in their place to protect me a bit but yeah it was um it was an environment where lads had had to fight, scrap. Um, I'm from a working class family, but we weren't, I can't sit and say if we were a family that didn't have food on the table or yeah. some of those hardships that I know a lot of the players I'm managing have gone through and a lot of the players I've played with have gone through. So I almost had it, had it well, I'm going to prove that although I've not quite had it as tough, I've still got the same motivation and the same desire, which I think people are always trying to test and question when you're making your way. So for me, it was a brilliant environment because in the, in the regard that everybody had come from either through the youth system or from non-league or from lower divisions. So the, the they'd all been rejected and they all had a point to prove. It's very similar to Wimbledon story. Um, 
a really top manager, Steve Koppel, you know, very bright university graduate. So actually quite ahead of his time, but managed to create an environment, really clear way of playing. What we didn't have when I look back and when I look at the stories of players that really reached the top, top performance, we didn't have that insight into what real excellence looked like. So we had the hunger, we had the drive, but I think when you're brought up in a institution like Liverpool or Manchester United, the walls are full of winning. The bar is you have to win. You're raised that you know what that looks like from the start. Whereas we were still fighting, scrapping, and we didn't have those experiences as well. So as young players, it gave us hunger, drive, desire, um, but we maybe lacked a little bit of belief in what was possible and without knowing what the end can look like or needs to look like, I think you, you don't have that full understanding. But it obviously helped to develop resilience in you that period, particularly when you go in and there are questions being asked of you. And I think we talk a lot about resilience on the podcast because it is so vital and it's a, it's a hard thing to develop in people because you only become resilient through difficult times. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, rejected from Southampton when I was 14 as a schoolboy. Um, had, you know, left out the youth team at Palace after eight weeks of being there. So, and then constantly from then on, in, anybody that's involved in sport as as the athlete or performer, it's a constant fight of injury, form loss, recover, you know, mistakes on the pitch that lead to games being lost. So dealing with that constant battle of criticism and keeping your confidence and fighting for your place. And um, yeah, I think that is just the environment that sport is. So inevitably you, you can't read that in a book. You've, you've got to go through it. It's painful. Um, but w what it leads you to is, is quite rich, I think. What does it lead you to then? Yeah. Well, I think as you get older, a better understanding because I think you go full circle, don't you? You know, you you now have the opportunity to help other people achieve more than I was able to, and so you you have a better understanding of what that took. And okay, how can I apply that to help others, which is going to be more rewarding in the end? So, um, and you've got context and you've got balance, and you're not, you know, if you knew. What, at 20 what you know now you'd be a lot calmer in some of those situations because you know you can get there in the end whereas but those doubts and insecurities actually drive you at the time so what uh, alan who was our youth coach at the time who then became first team manager i remember him saying to me you'll get everything you want in life but not when you want it and not exactly how you'd like it to be and i actually think that's probably right because i think if you set your mind to a goal you'll get there in the end. If you're really driven to do it, you'll get there. But it, because of all the things that will go a lot wrong along the, the way, it won't be when you want it. You want you want it five years earlier. Mm, and yeah. it, it, but then I wonder whether there. you don't even get it if you don't have those difficult... You know, we all spend our lives going... I mean, you probably sit here now at the age you're at thinking, oh, if only I'd known now what... Or, and if I'd known then what I know now as the England manager, I would have done this differently at Middlesbrough. I would have done that as a player at Palace or Aston Villa. But... The fact that you went through those experiences means you're now able to sit here and reflect on that. That's the point, isn't it? Those difficult periods are the periods of growth, basically. Yeah, I was manager at Middlesbrough, having literally stepped off the pitch the next day. So enormous leap of faith by Steve Gibson, who I'm really grateful for the opportunity. But in terms of actually preparation for the role, ridiculous, really. How can you possibly know... And of course, you're then dismissed as a... Did you think you were prepared? Because sometimes if you don't know what you don't know, it's kind of helpful. Well, that's true. You, you certainly think you're better prepared than you actually are. Um, yeah. And it, and now I look at what I know now and how much I still feel I've got to improve to, to be the best. And so you know how far off you were then. Yeah. But also, I also know we were doing a lot of things right. And because you didn't have the evidence that that was going to get results... And maybe in football, sometimes you, there are times where you do all the things right and you still don't get the result because it's such a low scoring game. Um, so you're doubting yourself. And of course, we're in a world where everybody else is certainly doubting you as well. 
Whereas now you've got 10 years more experience. So yeah, to, it's like comparing myself as a 17 year old player can, as an apprentice to a 25 year old international as a coach a manager at 35 with no not a day's experience how could i have known everything i needed to know see there was a question that really intrigued me on this card that i remember watching you at, um there was a fa cup game at manchester united where you played them a couple of days after playing them in the league and i remember being at that game and seeing you and, and you looked like somebody that just wasn't enjoying it you looked very different from the sort of public perception that I'd had of you. And yet when I see you now, say, in the effort, in the World Cup semi-final, you look a lot calmer, you look, look more in control. So in that period from being a manager then to now what you know, how what would you say has been the biggest learning that you've, that, that you've acquired in that time? It's a great question um, because I think there's so much. Um, Is Damien right, by the way? Are you different now yeah because the level of stress then was enormous because everything I was going into was new so I'd never planned a training session really with senior players I'd taken my uh, I was working through my A license with junior players I'd never managed a group of staff never had to deal with a transfer market never had to deal with agents never managed a board or well, you don't manage a board but manage up. worked with a yeah. board um, not totally clear on the style of play in every detail that we wanted. So then what does that need to look like on the training ground? So again, I was fortunate. I had some really fantastic people with me, experienced coaches, Steve Harrison, Malcolm Crosby, Steve Round, Paul Barron. So they carried me really through a lot of that. I had the respect of the players because I'd been their captain, but of course, total change of dynamic because within days I'm having to make decisions on contracts and so the le when I look back the level of stress because everything's new and it's a hundred mile an hour and every situation is different yeah it, it, once I'd lost the role I remember Steve Gibson saying to me you, you might feel relieved that this has happened and of course you're bullish and you think oh, no, you know nonsense and then probably a, a a week or so later, I was thinking, I don't, I don't miss being in that situation. And for a long time, I didn't think I would want to go back into managing because I think the brain is scarred and you don't want to go, you know, you don't put your hand on the fire, play, on the fire again, do you? So I, I don't want to feel that. Um, but then I started to do some work with the FA on youth development and building St. George's and it sort of rekindled my hunger for football and because of the different experiences I had covering games with television I knew the fulfillment would be coaching helping other people to achieve putting something in um, and also you know a lot of the time we have a view on how things should be and we fire those views in from the outside and well okay if you want to make a difference to youth development in England then get on with it. Don't just stand on the side, crack on. Um, and so through that process, I went and saw loads of different things. I learned a lot more about young player development. I learned a lot more about elite environments. I learned a lot more about my, myself, my strengths, my weaknesses. So yeah. And from, from there, I just recognize that every day you're learning new things and, and trying to improve in every area really. I think that's, that's really interesting because it almost sounds like um, you're at a place now where you're so much more comfortable with who you are and what you've achieved that you can talk in a way and do things that you couldn't do when you first started as a manager. So, for example, you can now sit here and say a big driver for you is improving people. Now, if you said that when you were two weeks into the job at Middlesbrough, A, it would have taken a, a lot of bravery, but also people would have questioned it. Whereas now you're able to say it's not just about winning a game of football. It's not just about three points. And I think that maybe that that sort of clarity of thought and that bigger picture, like you've written a kid's book, right? To try and change the mindset of young people. That's a brave thing to do when you're a football manager because people want to put us all in a box. And I, I sort of get the impression that you're at a place where you're so much more at ease with yourself that you can speak in a much more honest way. Again, I think it's a really good observation because I think um, when you're younger, you feel you've got to conform more and 
you might get asked to go and I don't know. I did a Bear Grylls adventure, for example, and in the past I'd have shied away from that. I'd have thought, well, I don't need to be seen to be doing that, and I shouldn't take it on it. And actually, it was brilliant. I loved it, <laughs> you know. And we're camping out, and we're diving off the edge of cliffs, which I won't be doing again in a hurry. But <laughs> but it was a life experience, you know. And I'm more rounded about having those life experiences and being bolder with decisions. Um, so you're you're absolutely right. I think you go on a journey where actually you start to think, well, I'm 50 now. Things happen in your life that you've you've stared over the abyss at certain moments, and things happen family wise or whatever that you think actually, what's the worst that can happen? Professionally, I've faced that. So why worry? You know, why come into this role? And I've seen obviously England managers suffer, age um and get ripped to pieces yeah. it's not a job that very often you come out of well but if that's my mindset going in we've got no chance because the team will pick that up they'll they'll feel that so what might we achieve because actually we talk about pressure but where's the pressure coming from we've never won in 50 years so let's give it a go yeah. we might actually enjoy why it why do we think that pressure is what leads us to success what do you know what i mean yeah yeah I, I would have said it's the total opposite, really. Um, so I've got to create an environment that relieves as much of that for the players and for the staff. But also we've got to handle expectation because where we were, where we are now to where we were two years ago, an expectation is different. So we've got to live with that. If we want to be a team that wins and is yep. high performing, then we've got to cope with that as well. So can we get into your decision making then? Just let's talk about that. With that emboldened mindset, you sit at home or with your coaches and you write down the England squad for the Euros just before it goes to the press and everyone has an opinion on social media and everywhere else. Do you care? What's your mindset? Are you anxious? Are you wondering what they're going to pick up on? Or are you really sanguine about the fact that these are your decisions? Well, the worst thing I think for any coach, if you speak to them, is having to make selection decisions and you know because of having been a player how desperate you are to be involved and how disappointing that call is so um you then know that there will be certain calls you make that will get more attention than others and i think where we would sit as a team would of staff coaches would be well nobody watches the players more than we do to the level of detail that we do. Um, and at the moment that can be all encompassing because there's games every night of the week at six o'clock, eight o'clock, 10 o'clock. So you can almost get, you know, there's times where I've got to take a couple of nights just to say, no, I can't watch a game tonight. I've got to just, otherwise they all just merge. But what it has meant is that we've never watched the players in the level to the level of detail with the ball, without the ball. So people will have a view but they won't know the full picture of how we want to play, how we work, what the cultural fit is. Are these lads that can be with us for 50 days when we're, if we're away and we can't see our families? Um, it, it, it's not, How does the way that their club play map into the way that we play? Because we, haven't, we can't play like exactly how Manchester City play. We can't play exactly how Liverpool play. We would have elements of bits of those what those teams do because we can't ask the players to do something completely different so we've got to play to the strengths of the players but we've got to have clarity on how England are going to play that merges the strengths of all the other players and covers the weaknesses that we have to to get the best possible outcomes so what weighting would you put on on ability then go so like their football and ability and how much of it as the type of person they are. So some of the points you mentioned of you're going to be holed up with these guys for 50 days in a camp. So like what, how they behave, how they conduct themselves. What weighting would you apportion to those two? I think ability obviously gets you in into the room because at whatever age group you've played or in whatever sport you play, the, the ability is what gets you recognised by talent spotters, scouts, whatever. But then what determines how far you're going to go is 
the psychological, the mental, the the cultural. So in the end, the best players have drive. They can perform under pressure. They've got the hunger to come again. They never give in. They're relentless in those things. I think what we would ideally then like are people who are team first as well. Now, there's going to be a mix of motivations, frankly, for everybody. You know, everybody comes to work and we've got in individual motivations. And that's fine because that is also going to help the team to perform better as long as those individual motivations aren't detracting from w what we're trying to do. And if we've got to take a player off after 75 minutes, there's got to be respect for the player going on and the fact that our outcome is we're trying to win for the country in, in our instance or for your club, whatever it might be. So, so I think it's unrealistic to expect everybody to be thinking about the team all the time. That's, that's just not realistic, but we've got to breed culture, cultivate that um, as much as possible. Always my job is to bring it back to the team. What does it mean for the team? What did we learn from that? How could we do that differently? Sometimes those decisions you can talk about. Sometimes when you make selection decisions or you choose players to play or not to play, sometimes the the group pick up why. Right. So that you know, I think in any business, you'd have members of staff that leave, perhaps for cultural reasons. That there's a decision made by the management, and the without saying anything, the rest of the people working there would go mm, well I, kind of, I think I kind of know why that happened so that does a job for you then doesn't it if the other players realise why someone's not been picked and they're a good footballer yeah absolutely yeah because again players aren't stupid they know why things happen they know who's with the team they know the energy drainers they know the you know I'm talking on in any team now um, and I think the other thing that your senior players do a lot of the job for you as well because their day-to-day -day habits the way they are you know we're very fortunate in our most experienced players Kane Henderson as an example captain vice captain they're unquestionable in their professionalism they're unquestionable in their preparation they want the team to do well of course they've got individual motivation but there isn't a young player that could come in to the squad and watch those two and think, well, actually they 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 duck, you know, they duck the gym session or they duck the recovery or uh, not a chance. So when you've got those role models within the group, new players come in, they see how it, you know the first thing you do yeah. in a new group is how's it how does it work here, how's it done, and the senior players create that. So do you consult them? Obviously, they don't pick the England team, but before you make your decision, do you consult the senior players? I, I talk to the senior players a lot. I wouldn't necessarily talk to them about selection um, in that I think, I think that's a slightly unfair position to put them in. Mm. There's always going to be a little bit of they're closer to some players than others. Yeah. Um, and they're also not watching the players in the same, in quite the same detail. But I do talk to the senior players about how we're going to be how we how we need to work what i'm expecting from them why are we putting them in that group um and how do we, how does how does their leadership grow because that's an area that i think we've needed to develop and still need to develop um see that leads to a really fascinating question then Gareth, because I, I i read a quote that stuart pierce spoke about you where he said that he spoke about you at aston villa where he said that when aston villa were winning you were never to be seen in the media. But, <laughs> but when Aston Villa started to get beat, you were the one that would front up and take mm. responsibility. And and, yeah. and he spoke about how how reassuring that was, that that's spoken an awful lot about your character. So how do you develop your senior players to almost recognise the importance of fronting up when times are tough or when things aren't going well? Yeah, I think the best way is to reinforce when they do those things well. So, you know, I, you can see them at their clubs. Declan Rice, is, as an example, is captain of West Ham at 21. 
this season's been incredible for them. Uh, the year before last, not so good. He was out there, out the front at 20, 21 years old. And I'm thinking, where's some of the other players? Um, but what I said to him was, look, these are brilliant experiences for you. I, I like the fact that you're standing, you feel the responsibility. You're not ducking after a bad performance. You're not looking to push the blame elsewhere. You're, uh, If anything, you're actually taking a bit too much on your shoulders. So keep a balance on that. But I think reinforcing that that's a good thing hopefully encourages him to keep to keep doing it so it's easy to pick out when people aren't doing those yeah, things yeah. isn't it but if you can find them doing it well i think that's equally if not more powerful and what are the traits that you had you've picked up on you know the captain and your vice captain explain to us why those two players have those two roles well first and foremost because we wanted a culture where um the players are driven to be the best they can possibly be. So, and they have different personalities and different strengths and different weaknesses. But we we need an environment where culturally, um, the 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 drive is to be the best in the world, and those two are, you know, they're driven to be the best that that they can possibly be. They also both recognise that although they will get enormous individual credit and both have, although that's been a, a lot longer in coming for Jordan than it probably has for Harry just because of the nature of his position. And um, But they recognise actually it's about being in a winning team in the end. So they've been brilliant, at, I think, helping younger players come in and settle. You know, they'll sit with them at dinner and they'll just make that initial bit easier than maybe they felt it was for them at the start. And... Um, so I think it's the standards of what they do every day and how they are as human beings. I could regret saying this, but I don't think I'm going to see either of them staggering out of a nightclub <laughs> on the eve of the Euros. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think so. I so, think you're safe with that one. So it, it, they're, they're small things, but they're not small things because it just sets the, sets the tone for everything else, really. And then we need other leaders to come through. Harry Maguire now from where he was is now captain of Manchester United. That's an incredible learning experience for him, dealing yeah. with managing a, a club of that size or leading a club of that size. You see with Raheem and with Marcus, good examples of, you know, they are leading outside the game in in the things they've affected and what they've done. So they're incredible role models for their communities that they grew up in, for kids that think they could be like them for young footballers for and with the national team I think that has a different level of scrutiny yes people want us to win but I also think there's a responsibility to affect things beyond just the football and maybe that's impossible to do all of that but I think we should aim to try and do it. So somebody then that's had the good fortune of being in say like that Euro 96 squad that is often spoken about for the strength of leaders the amount of leaders that was in there how would how does the current crop that you're now managing compare from a leadership point of view? Well, they're they're on the journey towards it, really, because in that team, you know, I played in a back four with Tony and Stuart, who were both in their thirties by that point, I think. Paul Lintz in front, Teddy Sheringham, and then Alan Shearer was my age. Gary Neville was younger than me, yeah. but they were all leaders. And even the guys that weren't captains of their clubs were leaders in how they played. Steve McManaman, and Paul Gascoigne, yeah. David Platt was captain. So incredible environment, really, with top coaches in Terry and Don. Um, so the whole environment, uh, uh, it, it was like going on a soccer school for the summer because you learned every day you, you learned something every day and you were surrounded by people who wanted to win who drove who, who if we were in a bad moment we're going to stand up and um our guys are still going through a lot of those experiences right. so clearly jordan at his age now he's now a he's now won the league he's now won the champions league People like Kyle Walker now is in a Champions League final. He's won the league three times. 
all of those experiences in the end have a big impact on the national team because the level of pressure they're used to performing under the the matches the quality of the matches that they're used to playing in that in the end does impact what's possible for the national team because otherwise all of their high level games are with us under pressure and they're not prepared they haven't had that journey so in the last three or four years we've got a lot more players now who have won trophies who know what that feels like who've won at youth level with England yes. so we're building you know we're still we can't say we're the f we're the finished article because two years ago we we were winning games but not beating the top teams we couldn't beat them over the last 18 months or so we've won in Spain we've beaten Belgium we, so we've we've started to beat some of those top teams now we've got to do it consistently and yep. every time and I'm not sure you can fast track that process as frustrating as that will be because of course the expectations are that you know we go out and we win I think you 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 end up knocking on the door if we're knocking on the door and we're in the latter stages all the time when we when we moved to St George's that was one of the things we talked about at every age group can we be in semi-finals finals if you're in those latter stages, eventually you you learn how to get there, and and I think that's where we have to aim to be all the time. So as as English football has attracted the best talents in the last ten or fifteen years, and it's raised the level of our game, and it's dragged English players up with it. That's that's only a positive for the England team. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, I think you know I, I I was fortunate to be in on some of the discussions. It was a very controversial reform of the academies, the EPPP, which I understand why it was controversial because a lot of that um, focus was on the financial and um, compensation for young players, which is a really delicate area. If you develop a young player and you lose him for peanuts, why would you keep doing it? So I understood that. But what it did do was it made us look at what's the level of coaching how many hours are we giving could could our facilities be better i'm not saying facilities directly correlate to talent coming through by the way i think it's maybe the opposite but so it made us review academy system and what we're doing with young players and i think right the way through from there we're now seeing those players start to come through and there's no reason why the next 10 years for england can't be really exciting because the depth of talent we've put a lot of young ones in very quickly it should be harder for the next group to get in because the standard of player now that they're going to be competing against is going to be at the highest level so can you see a clear difference then between the england teams that you played in and the team that you now manage i messaged a couple of former england captains ahead of this interview just to say look what would you like to know and they they both had different sort of areas they wanted to focus on but both said i'd love to know how different the England team feels now to the teams that Gareth played in because the conversations I've had with former England players is they talk a lot about a fear factor playing for their country pulling on the shirt sort of filled them with a bit of dread because the pressure was so great and the success wasn't well yeah I think there's been different moments because I would say my experience with Terry in 96 and the, the lads there we had a brilliant time we played really exciting football where we had, you know, we're talking about talented players now, but Steve McManaman won Champions League with Real Madrid. I think players like him were really underestimated at how good they were. And Glenn, similarly, I think we played in a way. But then what started to happen was as we went out of those tournaments, normally somebody took the brunt of the problem. So David Beckham in 98. <clears throat> Um, maybe Phil in 2000 there was always a scapegoat um, you know that feeling personally kind of lift that a little yeah. bit <laughs> um, and I think there started to be well a, a feeling of if we go out but I'm not the one who's to blame that was almost the height of expectations and the, an achievement rather than actually we thinking about winning anymore so there was a period where it became can we go out in a way where we're not we don't get hurt um such a dangerous mindset that is well it? it's it's fear yeah and and i would say that as was where we'd got to and in a sense 
coming in after the Iceland game, which of course was such a confidence-shattering experience for everybody, in some regards that was a, a good time to come in because well, how, how much worse can it feel for people? And maybe we can be a bit braver in what we push and things that we try to introduce. Yeah. Although clearly we were taking the team at a time where that confidence had to be rebuilt and within any management job, you've got to keep winning matches to be able to make, to buy time to make the changes that yeah. you make. So we knew that in our junior teams, the Fodens, the Mounts, the Sanchos, the all of those players, we knew they were coming through and all the signs were they're going to be competitive at European and world level because they did that at junior level. Um, but they're not they're not here for the next 12 months or 18 months and now they're starting to come through, but they're not the finished article. So th that, that's why I think we it was important we found ways to win with the players that we had to keep qualifying for tournaments. We get, we get to a semi-final, which was important. And now maybe there's a, a new group that can we can now build with this as well. So is there still a fear factor or do you not sense that anymore? Well, it, it's unrealistic to say to any sports person, uh, play without fear. Yeah. I mean, what what is that? It's a nonsense really because it's the hardest thing to do, step over the line, stand, you know, sit in a car on the start line, the, the lights are going from red to green. There's got to be some fear that drives yeah. performance as well but it's it's making sure that we're not consumed by that and making sure that that's not inhibiting us to a level that we're not actually showing how good we might be and how do you do that then Gareth what would you say has been the most effective way of helping them manage that fear or the weight of expectation I think um I think we've tried to be realistic in when we if I talk with the media of course, everybody wants to hear that we want to win. And of course we want to win. But I think we've always been realistic, not not so much managing expectations, but what's the reality of where we are? So when we were going to Russia, well, we don't know, actually, because Harry Maguire's got four England caps, Kieran Trippier's got five, Jordan Pickford's got five. We actually don't know how these lads are going to perform in this environment. but. We like them. We think we can have a good tournament, but let's see. Um, now we're further on, but we're still some very young players. So are we a team that could win? Well, yes, I think we're in with a group of teams that could win. Are we favourites to win? Well, we will be in England because the bookmakers don't want to lose money on paying out okay. on England. But you can't ignore that Portugal are European champions have got some amazing players. France are world champions. Belgium have been number one in the world. So there are some really good teams. This is a high level. So let's be honest about where we are. We've, But also we, we're we not looking to avoid pressure because I think I said to you earlier, we've got to handle that. We, we, we're now in a different place to where we were two years ago. If we want to be a top team, we've got to handle a little bit of that as well. So one of the like techniques that we've spoken to other people on the podcast series has been this idea of conducting pre-mortems, almost like looking at what's the worst that could happen. Can we handle it? And then we've got the confidence to know that we can survive a trauma should that happen. Is that a conversation that you would be having with the squad, looking at what could go wrong and how we prepare for those disasters? I think we've talked over the over a period of time i remember asking them before the game early on um what what are we going to do if we go a goal down and there was like a look of horror because it was almost you you, you never speak about that you know you prepare so you prepare a team to play in every phase of the game with and without the ball um but as soon as a goal is scored, the game changes. You know, the, the the dynamic of the game changes, the psychology of the game changes. And it's almost like I played in lots of teams that we were really well prepared for while everything was at nil-nil. But then when a goal goes in at either end, it's all it's up to us. And so to actually talk about what are we going to do in those moments and 
staying calm and you know the, our first game in the last in the world cup we're one nil ahead england have been there many times before one one we're on the verge of a week of being up to our neck in pressure because it's not the start everybody wants and but we hold our nerve we keep playing we, we're patient we wait for the right opportunity and we score a set play in the 89th or 91st minute now we're off and running and we qualify out of the group after 45 minutes of our second game, really, because we're five up against Panama. If that had been 1-1 and we're panicking and we're taking shots from 30 yards and it ends 1-1, the whole of the rest of the tournament can look different. So that was a scenario we'd talked through. And and then, of course, there's the scenarios, but then you've got lived experiences. The longer you're with a team, you can refer back to the games where, look, we've been in this position before. We've come from behind to win. We've we've led from the front and held the lead. We've won in these big matches. You can refer to those performances that, that are really clear pictures in the players' minds, I think. And on the flip side, when you lose a World Cup semi-final in extra time, what what do you do in, in that situation to take the learnings from it but not make it such a big thing that the players carry the pain for a long period of time I'd be really interested to delve into what the post-mortem was after after that defeat yeah it inevitably it was more with the staff than with the players because I think uh, immediately I always reflect on what what could I have done differently what could I have what have I learned from that what have our coaching team learned from that and then so yeah, with the players, we had what we had to move quickly because we had a third, fourth playoff within forty-eight hours. So a bizarre situation, really. Um, and at that point, I, I'm not sure the players were ready for that level of debrief. We, they'd gone further than we thought we could, if we were realistic, on the level of experience going into the tournament, on everything that had happened. So I think that those lessons we had to pick out when we were back together the following season ahead of the matches with Spain and the, uh, Croatia again with the Nations League. So what have we learned from those games? We've actually got the direct opponents again. So we, we go to Croatia and draw. We, we then beat them at home. So we learned a, a huge amount. And of course, we, we didn't even know... What, there were some physical challenges with that tournament to to go seven matches. We'd never we'd never had to do that for for a number of years. So, well, we know actually we're going to have to be physically in a certain place to be able to cope with those seven games. The turnaround, you get into the bigger matches and you've got less time to prepare, less time to recover. So, you're thinking a World Cup semi final, you're going to have ages to prepare. It's such a big game, but. We play Sweden on the Saturday. We've got to fly back to St. Petersburg with with two days prep, quick turnaround, and we're into a semi final. So we had long, you know, six months to prepare for Tunisia in the first game, and yeah. two days for the semi final. So there were all these things that you learn through going on that journey that prepare you for the, for the next time. And as a reflective learner, what would you say you uh, was the biggest takeaway that you uh, that that you experience that you'll take into this summer's European Championships. Again, I know, I know we always look for a one, yeah, a, a one piece answer. But I just think there are a huge number of things. The, the biggest things for me are actually the things we did right, and making sure that we continue to do those things right, but evolve them. So there, there are things that we know are the right things to do around the, the makeup of the squad or for example we'd like to give the we we involved families a lot last time the day after a game they were able to come in so we know that was the right thing to do but we won't be able to do it this time because of the covid restrictions so how are we going to how are we going to navigate that how are we going to allow the players to be relaxed enough that it doesn't feel uptight performance environment because they can't get to see the family they can't we're at home and we can't get home we had more contact when we were in Russia so there were a lot of things that I think we did right I think the things we did we could have done better 
there'd be tactical decisions within the semi-final for sure. There would be perhaps refreshing the team at certain times. You know, we've, I mean, yeah, we reviewed and we reviewed and we reviewed to the point where, you know, a few weeks after it, I'm more depressed than when we lost <laughs> it at the time because, you, but I think that you have to go through that. You know, you, you've got to live through that. So we didn't come home patting ourselves on the back for best performance since whenever. We, we're coming home thinking, hmm, semi-final and actually how, how do we go further now? How do we how do we improve? How do we evolve? And who helps you, Gareth, in terms of for you as a head coach then? Who, who's the one that sits with you and goes through a review of, of your coaching style? Yeah, there's, there'd be a few different people. So we have, I mean, Steve Holland, who is first team coach and my assistant, I mean, he's more than that, really. Um, he's such a, we've got such a trusted way of working. It's remarkable, really. We didn't really know each other until I, I took the under-21s job. I went to watch Chelsea work when Jose was there, or it was actually Andre Villas-Boas, and I saw Steve coaching and we chatted about England briefly and it just stuck in my mind. And when I got the under-21s job, I was thinking who would be the best person to come and work with these young players to complement what I can give them. And from there, we've developed a huge trust and a way of working that he will do a lot of the work on the pitch because he's a master in that area. And I'll do little bits and pieces there, but I can observe more and I can look at the fuller picture and, and then I've got strengths in other areas. So we would spend hours together um, and I think we're very honest with each other on our feedback. We've got psychologists over the period of time we've worked with the team who I think are good at those sorts of observations. How are you delivering meetings? What messages are you giving? And then there's some brilliant coaching interactions with you're fortunate in a role like I'm in. It opens the door to speak with Eddie Jones is the um Toto, you know, two days with Toto Wolf. Uh, you know, he he let me in on the pre-race briefing with Lewis Hamilton, and so you you. What was your biggest takeaway from that small insight into the world of F one? Well, I loved the fact that when you walked in the office, there's an F one car in the middle of the office, which is quite a bold yeah. statement in itself. You can't it, do that with Harry Kane, can you? You, you can't really. But <laughs> it was busy. a reminder that whether you're working in the commercial department. You know, so you're getting the money in to put the and the brandings on it. Every we're all working to put that car on the road, basically, and to create this team. And that goes back to what we were saying before. That's how it has to be for our staff. That every piece is important, and quite often that importance is only recognised if it's not done correctly. Because people jump on, oh, why? Why didn't they? Why weren't they physically in the right condition? Why didn't the medical team sort that? Why didn't the commercial team get this bit right? And it's underestimated when those things are done in the right way, the the little bits of value it's added to the team, performance of the team, I think. I think there's a there's another similarity actually with you and anyone that works in Formula One like Toto Wolf is the limited amount of time he gets with his drivers. You know, they're there a day before the race. Someone like Lewis Hamilton, who's a busy guy, there's lots going on. Toto has to make sure that message that he wants to pass on is delivered as succinctly as possible. Can we just talk about the challenge of how little time you get with your players and how you create a culture, how you give them an understanding of your England setup with such limited amount of time with them? Yeah, I, I think um, with quite a few of this group, we've worked with them since they were in the under 21s. So. Harry Kane, John Stones, Raheem a little bit. Um, yeah, right through to all the young ones coming through now, so Pickford. Um, so a lot of players who had a, quite an understanding of how we were and what we were trying to create. But then I, I don't think you should be shy of repeating the, the right messages. Now, I know there's a balance there because players can zone out if you if you're going on too much but when you're not working with them all the time as soon as they come back in 
of course, we get them quite often. We're playing Thursday. They play Sunday for their club. They're emotionally charged from the game on the Sunday. So I can't give them huge amounts of information on the Monday. I've got to recognise where they are. They're still decompressing the club game. But I can start to nudge them into, OK, we're not just put the kit on now. We've, we're we moving into England mode. They, they actually pick up because they're pleased to be back together. Right. I, I know when I played with... Viduka and Schwartz, so they loved going home to play for Australia because they were back with their mates that they'd played with the junior level for years. And it's the same with our lads. They love, of course, playing for their clubs, but they also, so it's not, I don't see it as club versus country, it's club and country. They come back in, it's at the England club where they've grown up with each other, they've played at junior level, they've shared experiences over a period of time. So I think naturally they start to sit and have dinner and for me, that was the hardest part of the autumn with having to do all of that part with masks on and can't sit for too long and hugely challenging for everybody. So those soft periods, if you like, are really important for you as well, not just on the training pitch. Definitely. I think things like meal times are critical. We've got a brilliant chef, brilliant chef, and it's an opportunity for everybody to sit, chat, get to know each other better, enjoy the food. So there was a period where actually we'd got staff meetings booked in um, at the at, at mealtime during the World Cup. And I had to say that, actually, look, I, respectfully, I'm not having this because I want to sit and eat. <laughs> I'm missing out on the opportunity to maybe just go and sit with a player or a member of staff who I've not had time to see. And also, let's get together for me. Let's have one moment of the day where actually we're all just in together and we're chatting and and. The food is important, you know, an army marches on its stomach. It, yeah. it, it's a classic example of if it's not right, everybody's pretty quick to say it's not right. We're in a fortunate place where it's brilliant and I think it, it adds to the culture. Yeah, definitely. I remember I was in Argentina a few years ago with a with a team and walking into a room and the coaches were horrified that the squad were all watching Love Island together. <laughs> I remember having the conversation that said, actually, forget what they're watching. It's the fact that, Every player is sat in that room, they're engaging on a shared objective. That that's where the strength of of relationships are being. Hundred uh, percent. I used to play. Uh, I'm not a card player, but we used to play a game called Hearts, which is a sort of counting game. And so I, I was playing with Pierce and Adams and Teddy. So Teddy would be different, but you know, with Piercey, we were never going to be playing for more than a fiver. That was for certain. <laughs> but it, it, each afternoon we would have a game of hearts for an hour, a cup of tea. And in those days you could have a scone with clotted cream at Burnham Beaches, <laughs> which is now obviously not on an athlete's menu. Yeah. And we'd watch people walk through and we'd chat and Gascoigne would walk past, you know, to play tennis. And then we'd be playing and then Gascoigne would walk past to play snooker with somebody <laughs> else. But, you know, we remember those experiences and, but we were chatting and we were chatting about football and what, what did Cluffy do in those days? You know, how did he yeah. deal with that? And, Teddy at that point was hadn't quite gone to United, but Tony's dealing with Arsene Wenger coming in, and oh, this is different to George. Yeah. And so you're learning about the game, and so for your players to be together, spending time together, that's part of how they learn the game. We'd we'd love to think it's all about the coaches, and but it's not. It, you know, they'll learn by playing with good players in training playing against good players and chatting about the games and each other's experiences, I think. And knowing each other as well. Have you heard the episode we did with Sio Polisi, the, the Springbok Not captain? Not yet. First no. ever black Springbok captain. Yeah. And he, he sort of explains to us that the biggest thing is to get to the heart of his teammates, not the head of his teammates. Because then when you're up against it, 75th minute, three points down, need to go and score, you look at the guy next to you and he's not a teammate, he's a friend. And it's that extra 1% you get from that relationship with them that actually means you get the score and you and you get the win. 100%. And of course, the more limited the time, the harder that is to, to get deep in that way, which is why some consistency with the is group. It's hard and, then when you want to get into them quick and you have to look at them and think, bloody hell, he played in the Manchester Derby 12 hours ago. I can't do what I want, but you're desperate to start yeah, imparting yeah. your messages. It's 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 one of the biggest challenges of international football or international sport, probably, I'm sure. Rugby probably get a bit more time because of the calendar. 
but yeah, you've got to get the balance. You want to, you want time on the training pitch, but for example, in March, we didn't run a session for longer than an hour because we know physically where the players are. So we, we don't want to break them. We're not going to improve them physically. So we've got to manage that. It'll be the same this summer then, won't it? Yeah. We've got to refresh, but we, we it's the psychological refreshing, I think, as much as the physical. We won't, we won't overload them physically. Um, but psychologically, what, what we've all lived through, we've got to bear in mind not just what the football season's been, but what personally they've all lived through, what's going on with their families. All of those things will potentially play a part in, for want of a better word, the animal that walks through the door. You know, that if we're not recognising that and the impact on their performance from that, then we're missing an opportunity to help them get the best out of themselves, really. Yeah, there is a positive there, isn't there, to limited time with players. If you're a club manager and you spend 25 million quid on someone and two days later you decide you don't like them, <laughs> yeah. you've got a five-year contract <laughs> to deal with, you can make the decision that that person doesn't infect the group again. And I guess you've had to make that decision in your time with England. Yeah, and that that's very difficult because there are moments where you're making decisions. Yeah, so Wayne Rooney is one of the most honest people in terms of his view of his performance, where he's at. So I inherited Wayne at a time where he was in the process of leaving Manchester United, really, not in the team. So I'm having to have a conversation with him and I played with him. He was a young player when I was first with England. I'm having to have a conversation with a guy who's one of the greatest players to play for England, who I've got enormous respect for how he played, but also how he dealt with this little period I had him because he couldn't have been more for the team, more honest in his feedback, more understanding of, no, look, Gareth, I, I, I'm not in the team at my club. I don't expect to be in the team here. Mm. So I I hope I dealt with that in the best possible way, but they're the sorts of decisions you're having to make to allow the next ones to come in and and sort of clear the space for the younger ones to go and have their have their moment he, he would have been brilliant with the other players i know for a fact he he, he was you can sit you could see the way he spoke to the other players really generous made the environment easy for them to easier for them to come into um did he understand the decision yeah yeah absolutely because he he knew he was he was starting to need more of a break um he knew that he's not in the team at manchester united anymore he, he was uh, i i when he went to everton at the start he was playing really well and i said to him look if i'm picking on selection then you you you're back in so you know i i never close the door to players i think that's always ridiculous why would i rule out the opportunity to pick to pick a top player but then at that moment, he said, no, do you know what? I'm going to announce my international retirement. I feel it's, it's the time for me to recover between games, give time back to the family, think about what's next, which is obviously now looking towards coaching and those things. Um, but we then had the opportunity to bring him back for the game, which created huge controversy. Because, But I felt... He deserved that. You know, we've not been good at that. You know, yeah. players played for England were then no longer picked. So that was it. There was no contact. Maybe you got invited back to a game. Well, listen, I work with guys line. now who said, no, I still play for England. I never got a, they never got a phone call, never got a letter, oh, never got mm. any contact to say, mm. what a career. I, yeah. That's a matter. That, that for me was, a, yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe it really. We, we, we've, we're, conscious of that you know we've got to be better at that we've got to make the experience of you know we now present and I know other sports have done this for years but on their debut we present the first cap with we've, we've got legacy numbers now which I think again in other sports you know that's important if I'm a player that played 25 years ago and all of a sudden I get notification that by the way this was your legacy number and yeah it's unique to you and only if what are we 1200 people have ever played for England 
uh, when we've done those things, we brought former players back to present those shirts. Brilliant. They loved it. Culture. They wanted to be a part of it. They were, oh, you're actually asking. Terry Butcher presented Gary Cahill with his shirt for his 50th game. It's quite difficult because Terry's doing the radio, so he'll have been criticising <laughs> Gary probably, but he loved the fact, well, I'd, I'd be honoured to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and we underestimate actually what that means to the ex-players and some clubs do that brilliantly, I think, and we're getting better at it. I, I, I think we can do more in that space. And is there a deal breaker that would mean you wouldn't have somebody in the squad? What are the kind of things that, so we, so when Jake mentioned that example of in a club, you might sign somebody and mm. within two days you realise they're not, they're not going to fit. Is there any deal breaker for anyone you bring into an England camp that you just think you might be talented, your talent has got you in the room, but you're not going to fit here? What kind of things would you look for? Yeah, I think that in the end, if if the traits you're talking about are there, they're probably going to show up at their club anyway. And so we're, we're probably unlikely to select them because right. we'd have seen those behaviours on the pitch or we'd have seen those reactions when they're coming, you know, being taken off or you'd hear things that were going on at the training ground. Right. So, so I'd have to say we've never brought anybody into a squad and I've thought, Oh my God, this, this guy's a disaster. We can't have him anywhere near. Right. But, but what will happen is some find it more difficult to be out of the team. And I think if you're out of the team for a period of time, for example, for years, um, when I was playing, I don't know, Nigel Martin was the second choice or third choice goalkeeper. I think those sorts of roles have got a shelf life that you'll travel for a certain period, but in the end, you travel and travel and travel, you never play. And then you've, you, you're thinking, well, you get to the point where, although of course at the start, everybody's desperate to be there. It's another week away from the family and maybe I could be training and preparing for my club. And yeah. so I think some of those roles just need refreshing every now and then. And that's where there's an opportunity to bring young players in to, to refresh the group and, bring energy to the group if it goes stale and there isn't that competition for places and the players that are in the team don't feel that pressure of actually there are people who are genuinely pushing now then I think we end up standing still a little bit and yeah. so so I think part of that challenge is are, are the players that think they're guaranteed to play are they feeling that you know, because whatever we say the motivation of staying in the team competition for places I think overrides what what challenges I might give those players it's interesting you said that because I think that there is the public perception that some players have come into your England squad you've looked at them and thought brilliant player but I'm not having you off the off the field or you're not the right person but that isn't that isn't the case you know well look we like again this is one of Steve's phrases Steve Holland uh, high performance low maintenance is the ideal um, we can go with high performance, high maintenance, because I think that's worth persevering with and working with. Um, low performance, high maintenance, I'd be less enthusiastic about. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's, there, there are levels of what you're prepared to go with. And yeah. I think, and what the group, how do the group see it? You know, again, players recognise this. Okay, there's a young player that comes in so Bukayo comes in from Arsenal. We don't, we don't know him really. We've seen him in the junior teams. He comes in, he has incredible humility. He's a talented player. He fits in with the group. The group are having him. You know, the group think this is a boy that, again, they're assessing in training. Oh, okay, is another young one they've brought in. Is, is he going to be any good? Oh, okay. No, he is. He can play and and actually he's a good kid and he does the right things. They and test them off the pitch as well as on, yeah? Absolutely, because all of those chats over dinner and those meals and the other players are assessing them. You know, if if their conversation is humble enough and they're asking about the other players and and they're following the right role models in the group and the the, the other players will be assessing that all of the time. That's how, that's how we've worked for generations isn't it you've yeah. read sapiens i thought it was a fascinating book where 
that's how our communities form and teams are the same. They, they, they tell stories, they learn off each other, but there's, there's a hierarchy being developed, isn't there? And there's a, there's a team, a bond, a family bond developing and yeah. they're all seeing where each other sit in that, I think. Interesting. I, I guess what you're saying then is the door isn't closed to anyone who's high performance. If you're high performance and high maintenance, it's going to be a bit harder for you to do your job. But as long as you're a high performance footballer, the opportunity is always there. Kind of your own growth mindset means that the door's not closed on anyone. Agreed. But what I would, um, the detail I would give there is high performance just doesn't mean talent, as in technical ability. That means that, you know, we've got forwards in Sterling, Kane, Rashford, Foden, whoever else, who work as hard for the team without the ball as they do with it. So there's no excuse for anybody coming in that doesn't have that work ethic. If if our top attacking players can do that, it's not just for the defensive midfield player to cover the ground. And, and those players, Players have got to perform well in the highest games under pressure. So not just against the teams at the bottom of the league, but for us, it's more interesting when they're in the top of the table clashes because it's clo more closely aligned to if we're going to play France or Spain or whoever else, the big Champions League nights. So why have England managers in the past always picked from the bigger clubs? Because you can see the direct transfer from a Champions League semi-final to a big international game. So that's definitely good evidence for us on selection. But I think we have also looked at, hang on a minute, there's Calvin Phillips hadn't played a game in the Premier League. We think he can come into our group and perform at a high level. And we've had two or three boys in from Burnley that, may, you know, maybe in the past they might not have had games. And we've got to recognise good players at, at whatever club they are. It's a good bit of education that for me in my job as well because I cover a game of football and a naturally gifted player you know, puts five past Sheffield United, for example, who haven't won for weeks. And we all go, well, Gareth has to look at him. You're busy looking at, has he been making the recovery runs against that team? And then following week when they play Man City, how does he perform in that game? Interesting. Well, we're quick to say people are back. You know? Are they back? You know, A team are back, but actually are they back or... Are are they playing an opponent that they should beat? And what what does next week look like? And what does it look like three weeks down the line? So there's this there's this tension for us in a selection basis, which is our most difficult challenge. And it's hard to explain to people because if we're picking the Olympic sprint relay team, well, maybe not with a relay because there'd be a bit of team dynamic in that. Yeah. But normally the Olympic team it's on the stopwatch you're the fastest in the country you're in this is a bit more nuanced because there's form but then it, players can be in form but not actually good enough to play against the very best and then you've got players who you've got evidence of who have been able to play against the best who might be slightly out of form and of course whenever I'm releasing a squad I'm always giving messaging that is for public consumption whilst trying to protect players. So I'm never going to talk through all the weaknesses of people in a public environment. Yeah. But then that leads to people saying, well, he said this about so-and-so and he's picking that one who's not... No, it, it, so, it, you know, you can be accused of double standards, but I've got to accept that because I'm always going to protect the players in public. So would you tell us a bit about the public and private perception of you as a head coach then, Gareth, because that famous quote was attributed to you. I think it was about Sven Goran Eriksson <laughs> of we wanted Churchill and we got Ian Duncan Smith. How would you describe you as a coach then into, and where are you on that scale? Yeah. I, I think that was Martin Keown, by the way. What was it? <laughs> Passing the buck. Come on, no, take but, responsibility. But... I quite liked the quote. I'm, I'm sure Ian Duncan Smith wasn't very happy about it, by the way. So what would I think of that quote now? I'd be appalled by it because what I recognise is that Sven was being authentic. Right. You know, he was a calm demeanour. What he brought to the England team where um, Kevin had been a different type of leader, more emotional, 
Sven was very calm and I think that helped people like Steven Gerrard, David Beckham, certainly in the initial stages with England that a lot of the noise, the hullabaloo around England was calmer. We're just focusing on performance. It's not all about banging the drum and we, we're going to win and we're going to do this. So he created that environment and therefore, why is he going to be different at half time in a game? He was that that's how he was and he worked in that way. Um so I've got you know, what I know is I've got to be authentic to myself. Yeah. I think in being authentic to myself, I think there are different approaches you use at different times. You know, there are rare occasions. I think it's rare because I don't think people respond to raised voices as much or aggressive challenge, but there are moments where that has to happen, I think, in a dressing room. To, you might need a, a response of energy or, and you've got to shake people out of the psychological state they're in. But you've done that for a reason. It's not that you've lost the plot at half time and you're going in with a purpose and you know what reaction you're trying to get. So I, th I think you've got to have different approaches with different players at different times and find out what they respond to and and how can we get the best out of individuals because i know that some wouldn't be able to handle that perhaps so i'm going to have to i'm going to have to approach that differently someone really short sharp no fluff yeah. you know don't don't give me any nonsense just straight on the line uh, others want me to, you know, lead in with a softly, <laughs> softly approach, deliver the the difficult conversation on. Come on, this needs to be better, and then fluff it in a praise sandwich or whatever we would call it. But some don't want that, you know. So would you deliver then two or three halftime team talks to different pockets of of that dressing room? No, we would deliver one talk, but the approach we might take, and again. Steve will speak at half time as well. So right. he'll follow my message and he'll he'll pick up on the bits that I miss or he'll take a slightly different approach with somebody and yeah, it's it, 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 again your your short period of time, so you need real clarity on the messaging, but also what emotional state are we trying to provoke in the team to start the second half? Um and they're all the considerations, I think, of of a coaching team when you're when you're right. dealing in that space at half time. And do you tend at half time to be head or heart? Like, are you sort your tactics out, or are you more about fight and spirit to the players? I think it, I think I think the first point has got to be. I think sometimes heart can be overplayed. You know, I was very much heart as a player, and that's why I like I loved Terry. Terry broke that down. And normally issues in games, the fans will often watch a game and say, oh, they weren't trying, they'd given up, they're not fit. And actually, normally there's a tactical problem that the team is struggling to resolve and it means that the game's not going well and therefore the energy is sucking out of them because they're losing belief. So the legs aren't taking them because I've, I've been that soldier. <laughs> um now, maybe on the odd occasion, there's a moment where a team have had a heavy schedule and they've got to play at 12 o'clock on a Saturday lunchtime and the first half just has lacked energy and there's got to be a, a livener. But I think those moments are rare with top athletes. We're seeing them perform unbelievably consistently with no fans in the stadium for 12 yeah. months. In my, in my head, they're hitting an amazing level, really. We're, we're not feeling that we've seen loads of top top games because i think the crowd adds so much to that but but i think on a consistency level considering they're having to find it all from within i think they've hit amazing levels because you know people that aren't involved in elite sport from the outside looking in we think everyone's like churchill we think you stand on a box and you ball at the players and you do it all the time 24 7 full of energy you're talking about a different kind of management sometimes it's like that other times it isn't the importance of quiet leadership has been downplayed for a long time. Do you think that in elite sport now, we're finally understanding you don't have to be a, a loud show-off to be a successful leader? I think in life, yeah. we're recognising that business, top businesses, sports, every industry you can think of, I think people are recognising it 
doesn't have to be the alpha male who that when I was captain of Crystal Palace at 23 I wanted to be first in the running last in the bar you know I felt I had to achieve all of those things to be able to lead each yeah. little part of the group so and now I recognize by the way I've got to be out the bar so that all the others can enjoy themselves <laughs> but but it it's it doesn't have to be that way and actually it's a driver for me that people think because maybe I would appear a bit calmer a little bit more thoughtful that I don't care as much or I'm not as passionate about it so it's a driver for me to prove to people you know that that does stir me there's another way um and I think what we see in our league is rich with some of the best coaches in the world they've all got different ways but they've got to be themselves it's got to be the way that's authentic to them and I think as soon as you veer from that people smell that a, a mile off if you're not if you're not yourself yeah I think um I think authenticity is probably the theme of this conversation you know and I think the reason why for you to be authentic is something that um we should really make a point of and just highlight is the fact that you're getting players who two days previously were hearing from Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola or Jose Mourinho or Carlo Ancelotti or Marcelo Bielsa, the most celebrated, most successful managers the world has ever seen. And you then get those players. It's so easy for you to think, right, I need to be loud and proud and bombastic and I need to show off and remind them of what I bring to the table. It's much harder to be spoken like this thoughtful considered a bit quieter but authentic but actually if you're not authentic if you're not totally the the you that you've become now not the you that you were when you were the crystal palace captain if you're not this you will never be successful and you won't enjoy it yeah and look i'm watching manchester city play and the level he's taken those players to you know people will say uh they've spent whatever but he's pep is a has taken the best players and been able to get them to do things that other coaches can't. So you've got to have a real appreciation for that as a as a coach. Um, so of course, in our head, you, you could sit there and think, well, what we deliver better be good because these lads are getting a high level of coaching at their club. And I know there'll be, you know, people on social media saying, blimey, we've got all these good players and this nugget's in charge of them, you know. And so you've got to keep proving yourself. You know, you've got to keep improving and proving yourself and make sure that what we're delivering to the players is the highest possible level because that's what they get on a day-to-day -day basis. And if and if our level as a group of staff um, towards the players isn't right, then they'll be onto that really quickly and they'll, they'll, they'll expect us to play in a certain way, to train, to be coached in a certain way, to be looked after in a certain way. Yep. But we can also be different because it's England and we're together for longer and we're living together and we're going to live as a family for 45 days. And I know that happens at a club, but not that you're living and eating every meal together and going, you know, in the last World Cup, we had family illnesses, we had births, we had... Um, you know family issues you, you're able to support players that actually that's I love those moments because we don't get that we're not with the players often enough and and that's where you can re really create an environment that you want but I know that you've described yourself in the past Gareth has been an introvert in many ways that that, that your energy comes from spending time uh, in your own company so when you come together for an intense period like that how do you almost protect yourself look after your own energy yeah again very good question because probably in the shorter camps i don't do that very well because i'm probably thinking six in the morning till 11 at night you know i might still be in meetings at 11 at night which you wouldn't at a club but of course if i've got two or three hours in the evening where we're not preparing the training or we're not talking about the opposition I'm thinking I can have a half hour here with this player or a half hour with that player and just have a chat and find out what's going on with his life. And Whereas when we're together for a longer period, obviously you can space those conversations. There's more time that you don't feel that you've got to fit those things in as quickly. So I found in Russia, I needed to give myself more of those moments of 
hang on a minute, you've got training, you've got meeting with this one, you've got meeting about that, you've got a press conference, you need to give yourself half an hour here. Maybe that's to go for a run or something to clear your head, but I've got to give myself that space, yeah. So interesting. We've reached the point of our quick fire questions, which I'm sure you've heard before, so I'm looking forward to these answers, right? Three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you must buy into. Um, I felt that respect is huge and probably covers a lot of the areas, really, um, because um, it's not just respect for... It's respect for everybody, the, the team ethos, the lady on reception... Uh, your teammate you know if you're if you're if you're coming off the pitch respect for the teammate that's coming on that encapsulates timekeeping encapsulates preparing professionally for a game so i think it's the, sort of the bedrock of everything really um and and the only other one i i felt was um was trust in that yeah there's got to be an agreed integrity to the way we work we're, we're working with top people we're privy to incredible information about individuals lives that of course going into a major tournament would be incredibly valuable mm -hmm. so if we operate without integrity at any level i'm talking staff mainly here then that would be hugely damaging and i, and I think that integrity in any business would be would be critical you've got to you've got to be able to trust people very good that's two do you want a third one not really should we have authenticity no. <laughs> we'll chuck authenticity in there so can you give our high performance community one key book recommendation that's particularly helped you go well i mean i love reading um podcasts have obviously become a different approach and i've got to thank you on behalf of by the way everybody that listens because you know you played a massive part in getting me through lockdown to be able to listen to the messages you brought and i would think there would be a lot of coaches and a lot of people in the public who would feel similarly actually the timing of how everything happened for me to to actually go for a walk for an hour with the dogs and and put my you know sometimes i like to just listen to what's going on in the world but actually i found through that period it was really powerful for me so it's one of the That's reasons i was you. really keen to come and speak because it was almost yeah thank you for for delivering that i've forgotten the question <laughs> a book, a book. or the you book. can have a podcast yeah the you, book I, I mean i think there have been I, I, when i was finishing plan i read seven habits of highly oh, effective people cool, and then yeah. yeah and then there there are lots of books so i was always into those management so good to great um so there are clues in so many of these different books aren't there that uh, it's sad but i'm always then relating everything i read to how would this work with the team or how would this work with my kids or uh, so there's almost never a switch off which is in some respects a bit sad you know you're watching a film and you're thinking oh that, that might align a relationship thing there and can't you just you know i can <laughs> see my friend can't you just enjoy the film and get on with it? <laughs> so yeah those those sorts of books i think there, there'll be others that that i've not thought about but yeah I, whenever whenever there's a new a new book gladwell or matthew side or you know, I've, I've got two of damien's at home i don't I, <laughs> without boosting his ego too much <laughs> they're, they're fascinating because we're, we're you're searching for small messages that that can help you improve how important is legacy to you well i think we should have the desire to leave organization club whatever it is that we're involved in in a better place than we found it so in that regard yeah very important uh, uh you know i've I was involved in the project building St. George's Park. I was involved in some of the restructure of academies. I've been involved with the youth teams with England. So those things ultimately have been 
as important to me as what I'm doing now with the senior team because we've left things there or we've started things there that can grow and should benefit England for years to come. So I think that's important. When I left all of the clubs I was at, in a strange way, I hoped I'd given them value for money in that you know, Palace gave me an opportunity. They made a profit selling me. Villa paid money for me. We actually had a fairly successful period. They made a profit. Middlesbrough made a loss <laughs> because I was too old. But we won the first trophy in their history and I had eight years there, player and manager. We played in a European final. So so I hoped that whenever they looked back, they felt that he gave everything he had. And so that would be important. But I didn't, you know, there's a Wolf Mannion statue. I don't want, there doesn't need to be a Gareth Southgate one at Middlesbrough. There's, there's people that Steve Gibson should have one for certain. That part of it isn't important because I know the day I left Middlesbrough, you, you're gone really you, you'd like to think sometimes as a player oh you know I'm a club this or what, that but the reality is the next ones are in you know we talk about the shirt with England we've got a great guy called Owen Eastwood who talks to us about identity and that sort of southern hemisphere idea especially the Maoris of you, this is your moment in the light in the spotlight and then it moves on and that's how it is I think your, your career you should do your bit, but you know you're leaving it hopefully better for the next people, but then it's their moment and, and we're out of the way. And finally, what's your final message or piece of advice that you'd give for anyone listening to this who wants to live a high-performance life? I, 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 I'm, this sounds cheesy because I did a book for younger people that was called Anything is Possible. Why did I do that? Two two things really. One, um, I do a lot of work with the Prince's Trust, and so I've seen kids in all sorts of different environments face all sorts of challenges, come through real difficult times, and go on to achieve. So I firmly believe that no matter what the circumstance, no matter what you've faced, the the title does apply. Mm. Um, and the second part was I know I've learned a lot of things that I think might help young people at any given time. And because of the role I'm in, they might be interested in hearing that message. It won't be different to a message they've had from their parents or from a teacher or, but to hear it from a different voice might, might land and might resonate. So that's the beauty of the platform you have if used responsibly as the England manager that it's not because it's me but it's the role and, and what that role entitles you to do or allows you to do so it, it would be go for it in life you know you, you can get there there'll be enormous barriers everybody will be knocking you not everybody that's not fair a lot of people will knock you there will also be a lot of people in the background going, go on get in there you know people like yourselves who i know will people to do well and love celebrate we don't enjoy people being successful enough do we you know it's like how do we you had joe malone on i've met her a few times fascinating lady and you know she's a she, she worldwide name brand what things she's created we're an amazing country really the size of our country the people that the things we've invented the, the the achievements we've made it's way beyond where we should be given the population and so we should celebrate that and yeah so i i think for youngsters go for it i probably lacked a bit of confidence when i was younger and didn't go for things as wholeheartedly as i would now and maybe you see the time ticking and you think actually let's just go for it such a lovely way to finish actually that really positive and i think that um to hear the England manager talk like that, I think is is brilliant for England, but it's brilliant for so much more than just England. It's brilliant for all the people here in this who are not playing football, not even into football, because I think that we live in a world, don't we, where it's vitriolic and it's totally polarised and it's heaven or hell all the time and everyone's scrutinised and everyone's critical and everyone's sort of scrapping for their own little inch. And you are an enabler, you know, you're doing the England job, not for yourself. 
you're doing your England job to lift up the others around you, whether they're the coaches, whether they're young players, whether they're young people who've been inspired by the fact that you're the England manager. And I think that probably has been the case rarely, particularly in, in elite sport. So for you to be in that position and to use it for this reason, I think is fantastic. And there was never a conversation about being vulnerable, was there? Or about human emotion really in sport 15, 20 years ago. So for you to be having those conversations is um is doing so much more than just winning games of football. Um, but please do win games of football this summer. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, if we almost, we know we have to win games of football for some of those other messages to yeah. to carry power. But what, what you've said there, it does worry me, the la lack of just basic kindness to other people. You know, whatever, however difficult times are, I, I don't quite get the idea of sending somebody a message on social media and tagging them in and being abusive to them. Why would, why would you do that? It, it's we've been through a hell of a lot of a, as a country the last 18 months. And I loved the fact that people would do the neighbors shopping. You know, we, we had a period where everyone was really, we we're out Thursday nights clapping for the NHS workers. That felt good. We're going to have, to pull together as a country because we're going to have economic difficulties and we're going to, we're not out of this yet. And so we need that spirit of togetherness to get us through. And that basic kindness is the start point for some of that, I think. So, yeah, I think what you said is spot on. Thanks very much for your time. Pleasure. Really Thank good. you. Thank Thanks. you for inviting me. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.